sound is good enough for you to hear. Uh, if not, we'll rectify that. But uh, thumbs up there. Thank you very much indeed for that. Good. Um, we know that actually mostly what you're interested in is birds in Hampshire. We hear that all the time and we do questionnaires, but people are also interested in travel. And um, so we thought we'd put a travel talk on. And a couple of years ago, I took the opportunity to travel to um, two places that I'd always wanted to do. One was to travel all the way up from the bottom end of Argentina via South Georgia, up through the Atlantic to Europe. And then the other trip was to go to New Zealand and travel from there down south all the way to when the Antarctic seas start and then back around again. So I did both of those in, in 2018 and that's going to be the talk for tonight. So I'm just going to see if I can go back to resuming slideshow that um, let me just see if I can find the right button because at the moment I think you're just seeing the whole thing aren't you? You're not seeing um, there we go. That should be right. Are you just tell, tell me Barry are you seeing the picture as you'd expect. You've got it Keith now, yep, all there. All Fantastic, good. good, right, well, birding the remote, the world's remote islands. I'll talk for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and these really are remote places. They are a long, long way from or other mainland areas. They are within range of other islands, but quite often they're islands that nobody lives on. So um, the first trip I did was, as I mentioned, from the bottom end of South America, Ushuaia, which is a city at the bottom end of Argentina. As you can see, I headed out. Um, I didn't actually go to the Antarctic Peninsula. That is an option you can do on that trip sometimes. Uh, but I went across to South Georgia, then to Gough Island, Tristan da Cunha, St Helena, Ascension Island, and then the Cape Verdes. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could have carried on up to Amsterdam, which is where, or Rotterdam, wherever the, the ship stopped. Um, but I got off at Cape Verde because frankly, by that time, you know, pretty much had enough time at sea, nearly six weeks in total. It's called the Atlantic Odyssey. That's how it's marketed. Um, so Ushuaia is the bottom end of Argentina. Fin del Mundo is Spanish for end of the world. And it really is the end of the world. The next thing you hit when you go south from there is Antarctica. And it's a, a good place to go birding. I do a talk also about Antarctica. And I always start by saying if you're doing a trip like this, get down there early because if you're late the ship is not going to wait for you. So have a couple of days birding around Ushuaia, great mountain ranges behind the city and glaciers you can, can go and have a look for. Uh, rocky slopes like this with plenty of snow even in the summertime uh, because this is the summertime for them. And the bird I really wanted to see in this area was the white-bellied seed snipe. It's quite a hard bird to find there are, I think, half a dozen seed snipe species. This is the biggest one. It's a bit like a pigeon, um, but also a bit like a snipe. So quite hard to work out where you're going to put it, but it is a, a wading bird and beautifully camouflaged until it walks onto the snow. And then, of course, it sticks out like a sore thumb. But really wonderful patterning on the, on the feathers there, almost like a pheasant. It's quite a, quite a big bird, actually, a bit bigger than I expected, but I had to wear snowshoes to get there. It was quite an ordeal. Not something I do if you were just on your own, because if you got stuck up there or fell into a crevasse or something, or just fell into snow, you'd, you'd be in a mess. I quite often put my foot down and found that it went down several feet, so you've got to be a bit careful. And also around Ushuaia, you've got plenty of other things you can do. There are lakes and there's the shoreline as well. So as I say, you do want to make sure you're down there early to get on board your ship. And this is my ship. It's called Plensius. It's um, a Dutch ship owned by the company called Ocean Wide Expeditions. It used to be um, part of the Royal Navy, this ship, but it's been changed around and strengthened for going through ice. And it takes 115 passengers. So it's a small ship by standards uh, you might see elsewhere. So for example, Hertegruten, I think, have a ship that takes about 500. This is much smaller and the benefit of being in a small ship is that when you want to go on landings and things and go off in a zodiac to, to land on, on a, an island it, it's quick to get you there it's it's you know you're not having to wait hours for everyone to get off so anyway we're at sea we're heading out to south georgia and if anyone's seen my antarctic talk you will recognize one or two slides because i'm just going to show you a few of them here these are antarctic prions prions are a kind of little tiny fulmer 
all of the species are very similar looking with this kind of patterning on the wing. And the only way you can really tell what they are is by getting great photos of close up birds or perhaps having them in the hand. I spoke to somebody who was studying two species that are very similar uh, that live on Gough Island. And I said, how do you tell them apart? He said, there's two millimeters difference in the length of the bill. That's the only way he knows. And even he didn't know. Um, Grey-headed albatross is another bird that you might find quite quickly when you're heading out to South Georgia. Not in large numbers, but they do come around the ship within the first day or so. And the one that everybody wants to see, the wandering albatross, the largest bird in the world, although it kind of shares that with, um, with the Andean condor. When I say largest bird in the world, of course, ostrich is the largest bird in the world, but it doesn't fly very far, does it? Um, this is the largest flying bird in the world. And, you know, they breed, but they don't actually, their chicks don't breed for at least 10 years, sometimes 15 years. So it's a very, very long process. Once a, once a wandering albatross is dead, it takes a long time to replace it. And the light-mantled sooty albatross is another one that you see quite quickly when you're out at sea. These nest on cliffs on a number of the islands, including South Georgia, and uh, they're, they're a good one to see as well, very beautiful. South Georgia is, of course, British, as are many of the places I'm going to show you today. This is one of the UK overseas territories. Um, quite an extraordinary place, and this is a place called Salisbury Plain. Salisbury Plain is a flat area, but with, as you can see to the right-hand side, uh, mountainous areas and slopes, and it's absolutely covered in king penguins. And I went from having never seen a king penguin in the wild to seeing 100,000. So I've never seen 100,000 of anything before. So I went from nothing to 100,000 in a matter of moments. And as we were coming from the ship towards the shore, you could just see the whole hillside is covered with these penguins. So it's not just a flat area, they're up on the hill as well. They have very, very good uh, claws. They're able to get up there. And when you're looking at them, it's just a carpet of these birds. Some of the young birds there, you can see the brown ones, they are molting and, and very, very uh, itchy. Their, their feathers, you can see, are, are they're trying to get rid of them so they can get their adult plumage that's underneath. It takes them quite a long time to develop into an adult, about a year or so from the initial stage of hatching. Everywhere you're looking, there are king penguins and they're displaying to each other like these two or just standing around looking at you actually, very often rather inquisitive, wondering what you are, some sort of walrus or whatever that's lumbering around and um, appearing on the beach. But it gets uh, you very close to see the feathers and the detail of the feathers and the beautiful, col beautiful colouring as well on each of these lines on the, the king penguin. I think they've got about 10,000 feathers, but they're really tiny feathers, of course. They don't need big feathers. They just need very dense feathers and, uh, to keep them warm. And these are the feet, as I mentioned, really uh, almost like a dinosaur's feet, huge claws. And when they're walking along to go up those uh, hillsides, they have no trouble, much, much quicker than I was in getting up the hillsides. And they do stand around watching you. They, they are not aggressive in any way at all, but they do have their space because uh, if any of them in, in, in get, invade the space of another one, they get attacked. So, uh, so if you go in a bit, <coughs> you're going to get attacked as well. Um, but I just sat down, seemed like a good thing to do, and just let the nature uh, walk around me and have the penguins doing what they do all day long and just having a quick look at me as they pass. We did actually have to put a lot of our equipment on the beach as we offloaded and we put down some sheeting so that it wouldn't get covered in sand. Uh, but the, uh, the baby elephant seals were quite keen to uh, take advantage of this nice sheeting, which was you know, much more comfortable than lying on rough sand. And as you can see, as soon as we put that down, they came along and, and lay on it. So we had to push them off. As soon as you push one off, another one's come on. So it's um, quite a busy time. They are absolutely adorable. Their parents are not. Their parents are huge uh, and very dangerous. So you, you do want to keep um, well clear of some of them. And one or two of the birds on South Georgia are special. This is a bird that you may have seen in South America called yellow-billed pintail. Um, but actually this kind of yellow-billed pintail's 
probably never seen one from South America. It's just been on South Georgia all its life. So this is now bit by bit being split off as South Georgia pintail. And this is a pipit called the uh, South Georgia pipit. And it's quite closely related to pipits that you find in, um, in South America, but this one is completely endemic to South Georgia. It almost became extinct because there were so many rats and mice on South Georgia. They, um, they came along, the government came along, and they flew helicopters up and down from one end to the other, dropping poison bait to kill the rats. And because the rats have gone, the, uh, the pipits are doing really well. So South Georgia was declared free of rats in 2018, which is a great success. So we're off to sea again, and we're heading off to uh, Gough Island. Now it's 1,350 miles away, so it's quite a long way to go. Um, there's absolutely no landing on Gough Island. You're, you're not allowed to get off. Um, you can get off the, the boat to get on a Zodiac, but you can't land on, on the shore at all. And the only people who are there are researchers and staff working for the RSPB. And it really is a magical place. Here we are. You're moving from the, uh, the cold Antarctic waters as we as we go um, further north and you're now into the sort of sub-antic sub-antarctic sub waters hard to say now the th i couldn't land as i said but these are photographs taken by the rspb staff and this is the endangered um, atlantic yellow nosed albatross there are two species of yellow nosed albatross now uh, the atlantic and the indian one this is the atlantic and and they nest on the island and, and not just this island but several others as well and you may have seen them on the recent um, Attenborough series where they had the baby albatross sitting on this mud nest this is not a baby this is an adult but the baby fell off the nest and when the mother came back um, even though the baby was right next to the nest the mother ignored it so the mother will only relate to something that's sitting on the nest quite extraordinary Anyway, that's the, the yellow-nosed albatross, and this is the Tristan albatross. Now, this is critically endangered, one of the world's rarest birds. It is uh, now numbering about, about 1,500 pairs, that's all. The RSPB is doing a great job on protecting these. Now, um, these are a couple of males on the right having a bit of a challenge, and a couple of females on the left watching. Uh, they nest out in these open areas. But the real problem that this uh, species faces is this. They are attacked by mice. And these mice are a real problem. They, they got there through a shipwreck many years ago where they were on the ship. And then, of course, they came on the land and now they're just taking over. The result is that these poor birds, these baby birds, are getting eaten alive. They don't know what to do or how to protect themselves and, and this is a dreadful picture i'll need to leave it on for a second or two but there is an albatross chick that has had its well most of its head eaten away by mice i'll move on quickly the rspb is doing a fantastic job sadly they've all been evacuated back to the uk at the moment whilst we go through all this covid um, restrictions but they will go back and they are bit by bit not only surveying all these albatrosses but they are working out how they can actually put poison baits to get rid of these mice. Uh, the species Tristan albatross only nests on Gough Island although it's called Tristan albatross you might think it nests on Tristan Acuna it doesn't it only nests on Gough so this is the one and only place for it if we don't sort this out we're going to lose the bird. But the, uh, the government is putting up money, the RSPB is putting up money. If you've got a bit of spare cash, throw it their way for that project. It's well worth supporting. Now, this is the northern rockhopper penguin. There are a number of rockhopper penguins now, three species now. Um, and the northern one has the longest of these ear, well, I call them ear tufts, but, you know, they're plumes. They um, have declined by 90% since the 1950s. So there's a real problem for this species. We're not exactly sure why. Um, of course, there's the usual problem of these mice, but it's probably more connected with the availability of fish um, as the climate changes. And this is another critical species, uh, critically endangered, the Gough bunting, only found on Gough Island and found really in amongst the tussocks and down on the beach where the penguins are. It, 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 benefits from having penguins because there's quite a lot of mess and dead bits and pieces which it can get hold of. 
So moving on from Gough, because we can't land, we, we go to the next island up, which is um, Tristan de Cunha. Now Tristan de Cunha is 220 miles to the northwest. Um, it's actually an extraordinary place and it has quite close links with Hampshire because back in 1961 this volcano that you're looking at erupted and the people living on Tristan de Cunha all had to be evacuated. Now they initially evacuated themselves to a nearby island they could get to but they had to be taken and they were taken to Calshot and they lived in Calshot for a year whilst everything was sorted out back on Tristan and uh, apparently they absolutely hated Calshot. I had a chat with some of the residents and they really didn't like it. So uh, yeah, Tristan de Cunha. Now there are 246 people living on Tristan de Cunha and there are only nine surnames and two of those are from people who are visiting at the moment and working there on temporary contracts. So basically seven surnames between about 240 people. So um, when you actually are asking someone out on a date, not only do you ask what's your name, you ask are you related to me? I think probably. Um, right, back to uh, the island. So this is this is um, the the main uh, place where people are. Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. It's called. Um, if you're lucky, you can land. I was lucky. The previous ship, nobody managed to get onto land. And this is the sign that meets you. Yeah, the world, the remotest island. It is said to be the remotest island in the world, but I think actually. There are a few other places that have that claim, uh, particularly in the Pacific, but um, there are a few birds you want to go and see on. Of course, there is a post box, although given that there's only about five ships a year that call in there, or maybe slightly more now, um, you've got very little chance of getting your letter home before you do. Um, but yeah, up, up in the valleys, you've got these woods coming down the sides of the valleys and you can, you can climb up um, a bit more easily than it looks actually. And this is the bird that everybody wants to see. This is only found on, on Tristan de Cunha and the neighbouring islands. And this is the Tristan thrush. And it's an it's a extraordinary bird because it's actually a carnivorous bird. Um, it, eats, uh, it eats chicks of other birds. Um, never seen a thrush really doing that before. And there's also this, uh, which you might think, oh, right, there's a moorhen. But it's actually the goth moorhen, which is a vulnerable species. It's pretty much almost gone from Gough Island, so they've put some on um, Tristan de Cunha to just spread them around a bit. Quite a hard bird to uh, get a good view of, because it normally runs off. Now there are two other islands that uh, everybody wants to visit. Inaccessible Island, which is five square miles, and Nightingale Island, which is tiny, it's just one square mile. Well, as you might have guessed from the name, Inaccessible was inaccessible, and so all we could do was sail around it. And here it is, as we're looking at it, so we weren't allowed to go too close. Um, but here are some photos taken by the RSPB using a drone, and you can see it's covered in some really nice habitat, really good um, uh, sort of uh, heathy type vegetation there. And this is the home to this, the inaccessible island rail. It's a vulnerable species, and it's the world's smallest rail. Apparently, it's very easy to see when you get there. But of course I couldn't, so I just have to think about that one. It's probably not a trip I'm ever going to do again because, you know, six weeks at sea just to get this bird is probably a bit more than I'm prepared to, to vote. And then um, we have quite a lot of these interesting finches. Now we've got Wilkins finch, Inaccessible Island finch, uh, and Nightingale finch. And I'm trying to remember which one this is now, but they all look pretty much the same. They have slightly different coloured beaks, um, slightly different size of beak too. Uh, but they're all incredibly rare, either endangered or vulnerable. So um, it's a very important place for those. Oh yeah, there we go. So that, that's, that's the, let me get this right. This is the inaccessible island finch, and this is Wilkins finch. You can see the, the difference between the beak, quite different. But apart from that, they pretty much look like the same bird. So we're off to sea again, back on our, our ship. I have to say, that's a very nice ship, uh, Plantius. I really do like it. I've been on it twice and, um, you know, you put on weight, I can tell you that, um, because you can't get very much exercise on a ship that big. We're on our way to St Helena, so we've got to go now really quite slowly at um, something like 10 miles an hour, uh, another 1,330 miles to St Helena. Now this is a, uh, a, again, about 75 square miles in size, very wild 
in some places, but not in others. This is the, 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 the capital, Jamestown, um, and you can see the ship down the end there. Um, it's, um, it's a busy place down there with in total 6,000 people living on St. Helena. Now the bird that everybody wants to see there is this, it's the wire bird. And if you've been in, in Africa and you've seen some of the plovers there, you'll notice that uh, there's a similarity to it, um, like Kitlitz's plover, for example. But this has got very, very long legs, hence the name wire bird. And it can fly, but it can only fly a short distance because you, know, you live on an island that's 1,700 miles from anywhere else. You're not gonna be flying anywhere. And here it is, look at the legs on that bird. You can see why it's called the wire bird. So they were down to 200 birds at one point. Um, the cause of that was um, they were eaten by rats. Again, same old problem. They were also eaten by cats. Um, and also minor birds were introduced about 150 years ago to control another pest. I forget which one now, I think an insect pest. And the minor birds take the eggs from the wire bird. So the Centralina plover as it's called. So this poor bird is, is suffering in everything, every direction. There's also a brand new airport, which um, has been put right on top of where they breed and so on. So uh, yeah, wire birds having a difficult time, but they're up to 500 birds now. So that's a very good move. It's gone from being critically endangered to now just being vulnerable. And the, the islanders do care about it. They put up signs to, to try and remind people to take care when they're driving around. Here's one on its nest. I was taken to see it by the warden where they were protecting them. And uh, it's a very pretty looking bird. Really, really nice. I mean, one of the world's rarest waders and the one with the smallest, smallest world uh, distribution. If you um, want to read more about it, then this month's issue of Birdwatch magazine has a couple of pages on it by me. And there's one, same bird, just actually defending its nest. So a bit like ring plovers, it stands up and pretends to have a broken wing in the hope that you'll follow it to get away from its nest. And uh, oh yeah, just to add to its pains, they managed to put a wind farm on top of where it lives. But given that it doesn't fly very much, I don't think that's gonna be a problem for, for the bird. So this is the oldest uh, inhabitant. Um, this is Jonathan. Jonathan was born in about 1832, which makes him 188 years old. And Jonathan is a Seychelles giant tortoise. Now he's actually the oldest known living animal in the world and it was a pleasure to meet him. He does look like he's um, got plenty of energy to keep going. Nobody knows how he got there though. So I guess somebody visited the Seychelles, um, picked him up, a sailor, you know, took him as a pet and then dropped him off at St. Helena some years ago. Probably all happened around about 1860 or something, you know. So we're, um, we're off again. Uh, by the way, a lot of birders on this trip, uh, of the hundred or so people, about 90 were birders. <laughs> so uh, quite difficult to get a seat at some times on the deck. Um, but it is good because there's plenty of eyes watching and uh, you, you, you don't miss very much that way. We've got 700 miles to go now to get to Ascension Island. And when you arrive, you get to Boson Bird Island, which is uh, just on the edge. Um, because it's separate island, there are no rats or mice, whereas Ascension Island does have those. And what has happened over the years is this bird, the Ascension frigate bird, which is vulnerable, um, they only live on Ascension, but they, if they go on Ascension and nest, they end up getting attacked by rats. So they've all moved on to the, uh, the Boson Bird Island. Bit by bit though, they're managing to remove the rats from the other, the other place. This is a, um, a young bird, not yet fully in adult plumage, or it could be a female, I think it's a young bird. Uh, and there they are on, on the cliff on Boson Bird Island. And you can see top left, a couple of males displaying to each other, inflating their air sacs to impress, well, to impress not each other, but to impress females who might be passing by. Um, although at the moment it looks like they're just really showing off to each other. There are plenty of other birds around though. Mask booby is uh, one, of the, one of the birds there, very similar to our gannet, of course, in shape and um, we also have, <clears throat> excuse me, brown booby. 
um, red-footed booby as well. If you can see the pink feet on this one, it's a red-footed booby. And then the red-billed tropic bird, which is very distinctive for those long tail streamers. So all of these birds are actually nesting on Boson Bird Island, and one or two of them are also nesting on the mainland too. So here we are on, um, on Ascension Island. It is, of course, an RAF base. It's partly RAF, partly American Air Force. <coughs> um, the, the runway at the moment is damaged, so it's not actually possible to fly in there in the way you used to, but that should be fixed in due course, which would allow you to fly from the UK if you wanted to go there. Sooty Terns nest on uh, a number of the areas and um, they're well worth visiting. You've got them flying around you like this, um, coming in close to see you, but also just down, attending to their nest duties. So several thousand pairs on, on one particular area I visited. But one of the very special things I did was see this, the green sea turtle, um, an endangered species laying its eggs um, it actually let, comes in, in in the evening and lays eggs overnight and, and this, this one was just still in the process, probably arrived late. Um, they lay about 100 eggs and then of course cover them up and then they've got the job of heading back down to the sea and, and there one is. Um, plenty of other things to see, uh, dolphins accompanying you all the way. Uh, we then had 1400 miles to get from there to Cape Verde's. And I won't talk much about that, but it's five days at sea, so um, it was a, a long journey, I can tell you. you. Get to the Cape Verde, it's a very barren sort of area. Immediately you're struck by the fact that you've got African birds here, like this um, grey-headed kingfisher. And you've also got endemic species like this, the Iago sparrow, I-A-G-O, uh, Iago sparrow, only found on Cape Verde. And then they have their own form of the kestrel, which I believe will be split off as a separate species in due course, known at the moment or nicknamed the neglected kestrel. So that was the trip I did um, around the Atlantic and it was a pretty special trip. Um, and I then decided I did enjoy going out to sea, so I thought I'd fly to New Zealand. So in November, I, fly, I flew to Invercargill. Actually, I had about a week in New Zealand, first of all, um, in the North Island, uh, again, just getting there in good time, just in case I got delayed. Um, and at the end of the trip, I did um, a week in the South Island. But the journey you do, as you can see here, you started in Vicargill, you go to the Snares Islands, and you work your way around anti-clockwise, finishing with the Chatham Islands and then into Dunedin. And uh, here we are in, in Vicargill. This is uh, right at the bottom of the South Island, quite a quite an interesting city, it's got quite a lot of history, and you've got a, a port nearby called Bluff. And this is the, the ship, the, uh, I'm sure you can all read the, the Russian script there on the side, which says Professor um, Kromov. It's an old Russian um, oceanographic research vessel built in 1984. It's been given a slightly more friendly name of the Spirit of Enderby. Maybe some of you have been on it. This ship does a lot of work down in the, in the Antarctic, uh, but it then goes, up to, uh, goes through the Pacific all the way up to um, Russia. And indeed, I hope to be on it this summer, going around the Russian islands. So anyway, off we go. Here it is. Uh, it's a much smaller ship. It only takes about um, 50 passengers. So you really do get to know everybody on board. Um, a reasonable level of comfort. Uh, you, you feel a bit like you're part of the crew. It's not like you're on a plush, you know, it's not like a QE2 with uh, yeah, all mod cons. And here you are, you're with the crew, you're with lots of other people. And uh, if you like meeting people, it's a great opportunity. Uh, if you don't like meeting people, well, you just have to eat fast. And um, one of the best places to be is up on, on the bridge. I have to say, um, it's got a huge bridge for a, a relatively small ship. And of course, when the weather's rough, um, it's a great place to be to, to watch all the birds. So our first stopping off point is south of the South Island and indeed south of Stewart Island. If you know that area, it's the Snares Islands. And we're talking about 119 miles uh, southwest of New Zealand. And the, the real big target here is the Snares Penguin. Now, most people who've done this trip, and I've spoken to many, this is all they get to see of the snares. They're, they're unable to get close because the sea's too rough and they have to watch the penguins through 
sometimes telescope, but uh, hopefully more often through binoculars, but really distant views. And the trip I did was the first one in the, pre the previous four had failed to get anywhere near. This was the first one in four years where people could actually get off and have a proper look. So here we have nice and calm. We're, we're really close now to the shore. Um, and here is an amazing cliff and well, cliff slope. I mean, these birds, you've seen the kind of feet they have. These are Snares Island penguins and, and they have got claws and they're able to go up that quite slippery slope up onto the side of the, uh, the island. And here we are having a closer look at them. So you're in a zodiac like this, there's usually about eight of you in there and uh, you get really close and uh, the birds don't see people very often. So they're really relaxed about the whole thing. They're a bit like the, the, the uh, rock hopper penguins in some respects because they've got that sort of color combination. But when you look at the uh, the fluffy bits on the side of the head, they're, they're very different in the way they're laid out. There's about six different penguins with the same sort of basic look. And you're not just looking at uh, bare slopes, you also got some quite nice uh, wooded areas. And in amongst those, there are other birds like this, the snares fernbird. Fernbird is a species that's found in New Zealand reasonably commonly, but the snares fer fernbird is split off as a separate species never been anywhere near New Zealand for years and can't fly very far either. So the next stop and the next day you're on the Auckland Islands. It's, uh, it's not a long journey to go, 147 miles, quite small compared to that last cruise I did. And, and here you can get off and you can have a good walk around. Plenty, it's a bit like being in Scotland, very big valleys and, and, and a large area to, to go around. I mean, the main island is actually let me get this right, I think it's 300 square miles. So it's a big, it's a big set of islands. The main island is there with seven smaller islands. So this is the, uh, the Auckland teal, which is a vulnerable species and it's flightless. You can just see there, it's got little tiny stubby wings. Well, you know, if you live on a place like the Auckland Islands, there's nowhere else to go. So um, you don't have to fly and there's probably nothing really that's gonna try and attack you. Albatrosses are breeding there too. This is the southern royal albatross. These birds are breeding on a number of these islands and they fly then right around the Antarctic in order to find food. And I've seen them off, I've seen them off um, South Georgia and off, um, off Argentina. And you know, uh, they've gone all the way around from one side of the Antarctic to the other. Um, there's our friend, the light mantle sooty albatross again. They nest on the cliffs. Uh, on um, on the Auckland Islands. The main one's called Enderby Island actually and that's where a lot of these photographs were taken. And this is the um, this is the, uh, the the local race of the New Zealand pipit which I think is also going to be split off as a separate species eventually. Um, but you're quite well controlled. You are only allowed on you know with a special trip like this and you are taken down a boardwalk so you don't have any impact on the on the, on the nature on the island at all. So we've got to go now 347 mi uh, miles to the southwest. Um, technically that was New Zealand. This is now Australia. Macquarie Island is Australian and um, you've got to get an Australian visa to, in order to get uh, onto Macquarie even though you're only there for a tiny time. You don't spend a night there, you're sleeping on the ship every night. But anyway, we've gone off there and um, I remember the warden rushing up to me and um, saying, uh, uh, he said, ah, you're a birder. So this is Australian accent, by the way. Uh, you're a birder. You must be interested in seeing the, the red pole. Um, and I said, uh, no, not really. Uh, he said, ah, we've got a red pole here, mate. Because um, red pole for, uh, you know, anybody who does that area is a big, big rarity, but um, it's the last thing I really wanted to see. <laughs> but anyway, here we are, Macquarie Island and um, the birds don't see many people. So here's a brown skewer, just, you know, having his photograph taken. Um, the whole island is rat free, I'm pleased to say. Uh, they've managed to do that very successfully. The Australians spent a huge amount of money on this. Um, the history of the islands are, I'm afraid, linked with whaling and lots of the penguins were killed and lots of the seals were killed. But of course, none of that happens now. And this is the one bird I really wanted to see more than anything else on this island, the royal penguin. 
I've now managed to see all but one of the penguin species in the world, and this was the, the last one to fall. The next one to fall is emperor penguin, but I've got to get to the Antarctic again for that. And uh, the royal penguins are, are great. They're um, nesting in a colony that's quite dense with about 25,000 of them together. Quite a few of these colonies around Quarry Island. It's the only place they nest. And um, again, they've got these beautiful orangey yellow ear tufts, which um, are a bit more stylish, I think, than the other ones. They're always fighting or interacting with each other. There's never a quiet moment there. Although here's a couple having a quiet moment. And then amongst them, very similar looking species, the macaroni penguin. Now this is a bird that's supposed to be on South Georgia, but somehow it's ended up on the wrong side of the world. Because if you look, and it's quite similar in a way to uh, the royal penguin, so it's just snuck in and hiding there amongst the royal penguins, the only one as far as we know. So they have their own shag there, the Macquarie shag, and each of these shags on these islands look slightly different, different colored eyes, for example, or different colored um, little carbuncle on the top of the head. Well, the next one we got to is um, 387 miles away. Now we're now heading north again, and we're heading to Campbell Island. Um, it's a, only about 80 square miles, so it's not very big, and uh, you do get to, to land. Um, here we are coming in on the Zodiac again, and we, uh, we stopped here on this beach, and this is a, uh, a Sitka spruce. It's the only, um, only tree on the island, and it's the most southerly tree in the world, um, and probably the loneliest tree in the world, because it's the only one there. Although maybe there could be another one growing somewhere small, but no one's found it yet. So they've managed to get rid of the, the rats. Um, so that's another great success. Plenty of sea lions. This is the New Zealand sea lion, um, about 11 feet long. Not something you want to uh, have any kind of uh, discussion with. Um, they're very aggressive if you get in their way. In fact, they, one of them attacked um, one of the people on the trip and uh, she fell over and broke her arm. This is the Campbell shag, which is again slightly different from the one we saw before. Um, so that's got a different coloured eye and it got a bit of red on the beak. This is the Campbell teal. Um, again, you can see the wings are pretty useless. It can't fly, can't go anywhere. So all of these would have been related to the brown teal of New Zealand originally, but they've been split off over the years because they've just not seen a brown teal in centuries. And this snipe is extraordinary. This is the, uh, the Campbell snipe. Um, so this would have been split off from the sub-Antarctic snipe, um, probably, or no, no, maybe not. The well, anyway, probably the New Zealand snipe. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, but these can barely fly. And when Campbell Island was covered in rats, they, they just simply couldn't exist because they, they can't really move very fast. So um, they all moved on to a small islet just to the east of Campbell Island, but as soon as the rats were gone from Campbell Island, they came back. And now they're doing incredibly well. They're really quite common. And here again is the Southern Royal Albatross. And if you want to see them in, um, you know, all their beauty much more clearly, then this is the place to go. And, and here they are. Here's one on a nest. They're spaced out um, probably about every hundred yards or so. There'll be a, another, another pair. And once again, this is Campbell Pipit, which is again a race of the uh, New Zealand Pipit. Don't know whether it's going to be split. I imagine it will be uh, before, before long. Next on your journey is the Antipodes Islands. And the, this is about 300 miles north of Campbell Island. Um, not as easy, frankly, to, to watch birds there. You can't land so easily. You're actually going around in the zodiac with quite a lot of swell um, and, and not so easy to see the birds. But um, here we have a different penguin. So this is the erect crested penguin. So once again, you've got the same basic layout, but as you can see, those, those head whiskers are really quite, um, well, quite erect. Uh, but other than that, they do look uh, quite similar. They look a bit smarter, I think, than the, uh, the others we've seen. 
and um, there are several species of parakeet. I think this is Reichex parrot parakeet, um, but there are several parakeet species on on the Antipodes Islands, and they're not found anywhere else in the world. So I was happy to take that photograph from a boat that was bouncing up and down. Quite hard work. Well, by the way, we did go to the Bounty Islands as well, but unfortunately the boatman managed to put the, the boat right in, in the way of a huge wave, which he could have avoided. And myself and the guy next to me, both of us, our cameras died immediately from seawater. Um, has recovered now just about, but um, pretty awful. So for a few days, I had to borrow a camera. Um, we're now at the Chatham Islands, and this is Pyramid Rock. So this is um, the only nesting site in the world for the Chatham albatross, which is a vulnerable species. And there are 5,300 pairs just on that island and they nest all over it. It's hard to see them there. So it's vulnerable because when you only, only nest in one place in the world, then if something was to happen, let's say rats were to get on that island, that would be curtains for, for that albatross. And there it is, the Chatham albatross. I think it's one of the best looking albatrosses with that wonderful banana yellow beak. Well, there are a few others. This is Buller's albatross, which uh, also came quite close alongside us. We put some, um, some bits of fish meat and whatever out the back of the ship and, and they all came in to see that. Um, this is the white-capped albatross. So some of these have been split off. That, this was originally part of what was called shy albatross. And here's the northern royal albatross, which is endangered. So uh, there are about six or 7,000 pairs of those nesting around the Chatham Islands. The um, capital of the Chathams is uh, Waitangi. And actually, you know, I, I, I sort of imagined the Chatham Islands to be a really remote place that nobody could get to, but there actually are flights from three different uh, cities in New Zealand out there. So you, you could actually just go out there and have a, have a look at some of these. You'd have to get a boatman to take you out there. This, uh, I, I love oyster catchers, and uh, this is the Chatham oyster catcher, a species in its own right, although it looks just like ours, doesn't it, really? And that's now threatened, not many of them left. And even a fewer of this bird, just 200. This is the shore plover, a bird only found on the islands around New Zealand. Uh, as you can see, it's got an awful lot of um, rings on it. Every single individual bird is now known because they've actually reintroduced them. They've, they've kept them in captivity and bred them to get the numbers up. So they're hoping to succeed with that. But there's a lot of work being done on, on many species on the Chatham Islands. It's like um, sort of Noah's Ark, frankly. Um, really wild place, but I'm afraid way, way too many rats. One of the things that New Zealand has planned to do is to eradicate the entire country not just these islands, the entire country is going to be eradicated from, of rats. Um, and I don't know how they're going to do it, but they, they are determined to do it. And every single community has got a team of people who volunteer to go out and set traps and so on. So this is a nature reserve. I think it's called the Teka Nature Reserve. A friend of mine works there and he's working on a couple of species. So this is the, the Chatham Island Petrel. Um, it's a vulnerable species quite hard to uh, to see that in the wild um, but if you're with him you're able to visit and see them nesting in their burrows and this one is the world's rarest seabird this is the magenta petrel not uh, named after its color but named because it was first spotted by a ship called the magenta i was lucky to see that bird several times at sea although quite possibly the same bird crisscrossing at the back of the boat now, some of the amazing things they're doing here is this bird, um, as a chick, is left in its burrow by its parents that disappear off. It obviously gets hungry and it comes out of the burrow like this and then leaves and never comes back for about five years. But what it does just before it leaves is it works out using a sort of internal GPS that we don't fully understand it works out exactly where that burrow is so that it can come back in future years and breed there. But where it's breeding is right in the middle of a rat infested island. Very few pairs succeed. So what my friend is doing and, and the government are paying for is for areas to be cleared of rats. So they fenced off areas and they've just got rid of all the rats in that area. 
and they've then made fake burrows. And what they do is they monitor these nests in the area where the rats are, and where they've got a chick that they know has been left on its own, they take it and they move it to a new burrow in the safe area, so a fake burrow, hopefully getting to it before it's worked out where it lives. So what it does now is it now works out the exact location it's in, flies off, comes back five years later, and when it comes back, it'll come to the area which hasn't got any rats, rather than going back to the area that's infested with them. So hopefully, instead of 50 pairs, we'll have many more than that in the future, although it's never gonna be a common bird. So time to go home. Uh, we're back on the ship and we've got three days to get back to, um, to Dunedin. And, uh, and that is the end of my journey. I, I really enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions you may well have. Thanks, Keith. Um, that's great. Fascinating. Some, uh, some amazing insights. Some what must have been an incredible uh, journeys out there. Some amazing science. It's some, some, of us, some of us can only, only hope to see one day. You've covered some of the topics, but there are a few questions, and one or two I'm going to probably just repeat, although you've covered them in part. Um, you've obviously uh, referenced on a number of those islands, the, the, obviously the sad news about the... Um, the impact that, that rats particularly are having on a number of those species. Um, so I'm not going to ask the one about which islands, because I think you've given a broad overview of where there are problems, but perhaps on a more positive note, I mean, you have referenced a few uh, programs like the, the last one on, on Chatham, but any other comments around some of the programs going on broadly on some of these remote islands to eradicate um, rats that uh, you might add as an extra comment? Yeah, well, unfortunately, a lot of the work has been paused due to the COVID uh, situation. But once it starts again, um, people will be back on the islands, uh, funded by the UK government, um, and indeed a lot of the work by the RSPB. Uh, I was on the RSPB council about 15 years ago, and there was a, a fair amount of reluctance, frankly, to get involved in the overseas territories. But that all changed a few years ago, and now it's the sort of in subject everybody wants to help these birds. Frankly, if they were off the coast of Scotland, we'd be doing it immediately. But um, um, uh, yeah, it's happening on all the islands, mostly uh, around New Zealand already, um, and the UK ones one by one. But it's, it's, it's hard to do. You can't just turn up and put rat poison down and hope it to go. Sure. Uh, you've, got, you've got to do the entire place. It takes a takes number of years, I can imagine, um, to finally feel as though you've eradicated them all. Um, picking up another topic that, uh, again, you've made reference to as you've gone through the talk, and that's about the number of um, split-offs, um, yeah. which are unique to, to, to certain uh, specific islands. That seems to be ongoing, um, and, and there's a, one of the questions that, that was posed before was, was, do you foresee some stability in that? I mean, it seems to be an ongoing um, core topic where the continual talk about recognising another split-off. I mean, do you see... Uh, a point in time in the near future where there'll be some stability and an agreement in terms of, of, of recognition of some of those split offs. I mean, it seems to be ongoing at the moment. Uh, no, I think it's going to continue because um, our ability to identify the difference between similar looking species is getting better through our understanding of DNA. So uh, that will speed up the number of new species that are being discovered. Um, and people are also working on this. Uh, so yeah, there's, it's like in all areas of natural history, the number of species is increasing all the time, even though, of course, a few are becoming extinct as well. And perhaps I may use that extinct reference to the big topic of climate, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, views on, on the impact it's having on on a number of the species specifically in these remote islands? Um, is, it, is, it, is it more acute in the remote islands, um, would you think? No, I don't think it's more acute. Um, the islands are basically um, surrounded by sea. So probably the impact of climate change, for example, on the land will be less marked than, um, let's say, if you were living in the middle of Africa where you're going to feel it a lot. Um, so the, the effect of climate change in terms of land birds will, will be slower. But of course, the warming up of the seas will actually affect the availability of fish because fish like to be in the right temperature of water, particularly in cold water. So fish stocks in some areas will decline. And we've seen that already in the UK. We know that uh, in places like Shetland and Orkney, the number of seabirds is less than it used to be because of the declining fish stocks. 
thanks. Um, I'm going to switch to a couple of different types of targets. One more broad one around um, nature tourism uh, and expeditions of the like, obviously, that uh, you've obviously drawn on an experience for this particular talk. Of course, this year's been a difficult one um, and, and everything's been on hold, but a view on, on God willing, we get back to something near normal here next year and beyond. What your view on, on the future of, of, of this type of nature tourism? Do you see it continuing to increase once we get back to a level of normality? Yeah, I think, I think it should do. I mean, these are quite expensive cruises. Um, I've probably spent, I uh, can't remember, I spent something like £10,000 on the one I did from New Zealand um, and a similar price on the one going up through the Atlantic. Um, but I suppose if you take the view, it took me six weeks to do it. It was on a daily pace. It's not a lot to spend compared to some holidays. Um, that kind of nature tourism, I think, is increasing all the time. There are some people who are against that because they think nature is being impacted by it. But that's not been my experience. I've, what, all I've seen is that the cruise companies, by law, are forced to be very responsible, not only in their biosecurity, that you are checking that you're not carrying any seeds or you're not yourself introducing mice for the next generation of seabirds, um, but also just where you go, how close you go to the birds. Uh, you know, several times as a photographer, I was wanting to get a little bit closer, but I couldn't. And that's the right thing to do. They, have, they, they definitely put a limit on how close you can go to the birds. Okay. Uh, and using that perhaps as a bridge to a question around uh, research and the accuracy of research, given, given the remoteness of many of these islands hmm. and how inhospitable they are, um, how comfortable can we be that the kind of research that's being undertaken can, can be kind of is credible and can be relied on? I mean, given given mm -hmm. some of the challenges of, of undertaking research in some of these remote locations. I mean, obviously, you've got some personal contacts. You referred to one. Yeah. Um, uh, comments there? I would say that the, uh, the research is incredibly accurate because the people are not just there for a few days. They're there for maybe a year. Um, so they have plenty of time to get everything set up monitoring what's happening over a long period of time whereas quite often research is done rather quickly and, and and therefore all you get is a snapshot so i think it's being done very well um the equipment they've got is very accurate they're using camera traps as well to find out what's around so they don't have to sit there the whole time oh, i think it's all incredibly professional much of it being done by uh, universities uh, with phd students um Similar theme-ish, um, one of the questions came in tonight was about longline fishing. Um, there's been quite a lot of coverage over the last recent years about the impact of longline fishing, but um, thoughts, comments around impact it's still having. I mean, there's, I know there's been a number of uh, positive trials and uh, new initiatives to uh, limit the impact on, 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 on seabirds, etc. but a few comments around how you see things progressing. Um, I, right, well it's going in the right direction, that's the first thing. Yeah. Uh, hook pod was an amazing invention, which means that the, um, the, the bait for the, on, on the long lines, the bait sinks lower and therefore the albatrosses can't reach the bait. Um, so okay, they miss out on a bit of free food, but they don't get killed. And as you can see, when an albatross gets killed, it's, it takes an awful long time for them to re be replaced. It's like one of us being killed. Um, so um, the hook pod, I mean, if you, if you fund anything this year uh, on a small scale for about five pounds, you can fund a hook pod. And, um, you know, for, amazing to think that for 50 pounds, you could actually fund 10 hook pods. And this would then save the lives of, for example, 10 albatrosses. Um, some governments are really behind it. The New Zealand government is one of those. Other governments uh, in, uh, in certain parts of the world are not so positive. There's been quite a lot of trouble in getting it introduced in, in some of the South American countries. Um, but I think eventually it will get stronger and stronger. And depending on how much pressure this government wants to put on foreign governments, you know, we, we should start to see progress. Great. Um, and, and switching back to the tourism uh, point uh, topic, Keith, time of year. I mean, what time of year did you uh, undertake uh, the trips you've done? And is there an optimal time of year? Yeah, so you want to be going down there during the summer. Uh, so the southern summer, which would be any time between really, uh, well, mostly in, in November through till, till March. Now, the, 
the trip I did actually with the um, going through the Atlantic, um, I had to go in April or March through to May because that's when the ship has to reposition. It works down in the Antarctic from November through till March, and then it goes back up to the Arctic to operate there. So that's how I, I, I basically went like a one-way taxi journey. Um, but normally if you go to the Southern Islands, you want to go in the summer. So therefore any time from November through till February. And the one I did in the New Zealand islands was in exactly two years ago. Okay. And on that general theme, is there a kind of optimal um, list if, if you're looking to kind of tick off number of birds, what sort of a potential number of, of species might you uh, potentially get to see? Well, you don't see as many birds as you think, actually. Um, so, um, well, on the trip around New Zealand, because you're going to lots of different islands, and you're getting a few on New Zealand as well. So you're gonna have a list of maybe 150 or something. Um, <clears throat> most of which, <clears throat> excuse me, are seabirds, not land birds. Um, the trip going up through the Atlantic, it's a much smaller list because you know you go to Tristan de Kuna and you get the Tristan thrush, and then you fail to get on an inaccessible island and you fail to get any of those buntings or the, the rail. Um, it's quite hard work, I have to say. Uh, you, you were probably, I was probably getting, Oh, I don't know, something like um, 20 new species on that trip. Barry, you've uh, muted Yeah, yourself. thanks, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> still, still slipping up on that one occasionally. Um, one on specific on albatrosses. Uh, do, do all albatrosses have a big wingspan, or are there some, uh, some species that, or subspecies that have uh, shorter wingspan? We all kind of assume they have large wingspans, but uh, any, 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 any smaller? Well, there's a range, but uh, they're all massive. Um, and the small, smallest one is the black brown albatross, and that's massive. Um, that's the one we occasionally get in, in Britain. We had one in Scotland for a few years, which we called Albert Ross. Um, I did get to see that. Um, but no, they're all huge. Um, the only difference in, in shape is that one got a sh short tail. And amazingly, it's called short-tailed albatross. <laughs> Um, a couple more, I think, Keith, as we close it to the hour. Um, there's a couple that actually were posted before. One mm -hmm. about the great orc. Um, yeah. all the, uh, here's an interesting one for you. With all the uh, developments in science um, and the possibility of retrogenetic engineering, do you, do you see the return of the great orc? Do you have a view on that? Um, well, I, uh, hard to know with how things are at the moment on, on whether it could be done. I guess it could be done, um, but I don't know that anyone's going to really bother to go and bring back the, the Great Orc because I, I just think it's a bit of an un unknown area of um, bioscience, but certainly it's moving that way. I've been reading about it and it sounds like people think it's unlikely that it's going to happen, even though they've obviously got DNA from uh, a number of specimens of Great Orc that they've taken from museums around Iceland and Scotland and so on. Sure, sure. And um, perhaps one to finish on, although I'm just checking to see if any final questions come in. Question, this, this, this must admit, this one you want to me, um, reference to super tramp birds. I hope yeah. you it to you. Any, uh, uh, any, any, any few passing comments about the super tramp birds you might uh, share tonight? Uh, well, it's quite a technical question. Um, okay, so there are species of birds that are known as tramp species. And uh, tramps basically are species that are happy to sort of rock up and sleep anywhere and uh, they're not too fussy about where they, where they go. So they basically are birds that take advantage of available habitat. Um, so a super tramp species in, the, in the, my example would be cattle egret. So when we were sailing up through the Atlantic, we had three or four cattle egrets following the ship. I don't know where they came from because we'd left South Georgia and they're not on South Georgia, but they followed us. They must have come from South America and worked their way across, seen the ship and thought, right, God, you know, here's our chance. They followed the ship. We were going at sort of 10 or 15 miles an hour. They were behind us um, and they were getting more and more tired. Um, I know one of them got nailed by a great skewer um, but the other ones did actually land and they landed on the deck and they sat on the deck all the time as we went on our way up to, um, I guess it would be to Tristan actually at that point. And they hopped off at Tristan and arrived there. So it's now cattle egrets going to be on Tristan. So that's a, that's a tramp species. And I guess super tramp really are those that are 
Well, no, actually, super tramp species, technically, uh, biologically, are those that are able to take advantage of any any habitat <clears throat> and literally, you know, grab an opportunity. Great, Keith, thanks for that. We are just, just over the hour. I'm just going to pause in case there's any final question. Um, otherwise, I shall wrap up this evening. No. Actually, super tramp... Um, the, the title Super Tramp Species came from a, a brilliant naturalist called Jared Diamond and uh, his works are really worth um, reading and uh, he was a big fan of Super Tramp which is why he uh, the, the, the rock band which is why he named them Super Tramp Species in favor in, in you know memory of his favorite band so I guess if I had to name species I'd have to call them the damned or the clash, the clash species. An insight into your taste in music as we finish the talk, Keith. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up tonight. I'm gonna to say as ever, Keith, thank you for the tonight's uh, very interesting talk um, through what must have been a couple of fantastic and interesting uh, trips you've been on. I know you're looking hopefully to the return of uh, some new adventures next year, as I know a number of people are. Um, thanks again for everyone to for participating tonight. Just a heads up for next week. We've not published it yet and it's not quite finalised, but we're hoping to run a talk next week on Wader ID. So back to uh, slight nearer shores. Um, hopefully, if I can confirm that with Marcus Ward, we'll uh, get that one posted for mid next week. But uh, please watch out for that one being posted. Uh, but for tonight, Keith, thanks once again uh, for a fascinating talk. Uh, next week will be our last one before the Christmas break, but we will be planning further the talks uh, at the beginning of January and through January and beyond um, so uh, please look out for those as well um, but as always uh, thanks for everyone for, for joining tonight staying throughout the talk uh, stay safe look after yourselves and hopefully uh, see you again next week and the weeks thereafter Bye Great. and big thank you to Barry for me uh, for looking after it all and Nicola for doing all the admin and uh, if you've got any ideas for other talks you'd like do let us know and we'll see if we can find someone to talk about it Thanks, Keith. Good night, everyone. Good night.